Okay. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge um, that SFU is on the ancestral and unceded land of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Katsi, Coquitlam peoples. Uh, that's at the Burnaby campus where I am. And the Kakai, Kwantlen, Semiamu, and Tawasan peoples, um, which is the Surrey campus. Um, all the SLC workshops, uh, whether they're live or recorded, are eligible for co-curricular co record credit. Um, it's like a transcript. But it's a transcript of everything that you've done outside of your classes at SFU. And it can be useful later on when you're applying for grad school or applying for jobs, you know, just to have a record of everything that you've done. Um, the way to get co-curricular record credit is to fill out this survey um, that's available online. And uh, you can take a picture of it um, of the URL if you want, or you can, um, if you go to the workshops page, it's, it's linked from the workshops page as well. Uh, oh, and in case some people weren't here when I introduced myself, my name is Ruth and I'm a learning services coordinator at the Student Learning Commons. Uh, Nicholas is asking, is there a way to copy or paste the links? Um, and I should have thought of that particular link, but I didn't think of this particular one, but there are others um, in this presentation that I will be um, copying and pasting into the chat box for sure. Oh, and that, oh, that's good that the email with the Zoom link had a survey link. I was not aware that um, our admin assistant does that, and I'm very happy about it. Okay, so this is what we are going to do today, what we're going to be talking about. Um, so what actually is the purpose of taking notes? You know, and the purpose really should be informing what sort of notes you're taking. So it's a, actually a very practical question. Um, how many sets of notes do you need for a given course? Um, and then we're going to go into specifics about lectures. Um, so I developed this workshop when we were all in remote learning and previous versions just talked about remote or recorded lectures. Um, and now I'll be talking about those still because some people still have those, but also in person lectures. Um, and then taking notes when reading. Um, choices of formats of notes, that's often a question that comes up. And then what to do with your notes later on after you've taken them in order to get the most out of the effort that you've made taking the notes. Um, okay, so before I tell you about you know, what I consider the purposes of taking notes in lectures and readings, um, I'd like to see in the chat box what you think would be a purpose of note-taking. <coughs> mm. Yeah, or you can unmute yourself. Okay, helping with homework, Brianne said. Um, can you elaborate that a bit? Uh, like, you know, how would notes help with homework? And if anyone else has an idea about the purpose of taking notes in lectures or readings, please drop it in the chat box or unmute yourself. Uh, oh, Hannah, to help retain, wow, now it's coming fast and furious. To help retain info I've heard from long lectures. Yeah, yeah, retention is a really good reason to take notes. And I think people do retain more when they're recording something. Uh, look back to aid in learning and comprehension for assignments and exams. Yeah, absolutely. Remember and understand the material that's along the same lines. Um, if the homework had questions about what happened in class, then you could use the notes to remember what happened. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, or you might have an assignment like that needs information um, to build upon. 
and to create a summary of information that you can reference later. So presumably later would be when you're preparing for an essay or an exam. Yeah, those those are all um, really good reasons for the purpose. Um, I think sometimes when students um, feel like they have issues with note taking, it's because they're not necessarily keeping those purposes in mind. Um, they're thinking that, oh, you know, I should be like, recording every single thing that the professor is saying. Um, or similarly, like when they're doing readings, sometimes everything just looks important. You know, if you're just kind of reading and highlighting as you go, it's very easy to highlight everything, you know, just kind of mindlessly and not be selective and not really learn from what you're reading. So those, those uh, pitfalls are to be avoided. Um, so this is, you know, this, these are the purposes that I can think of when note taking. And depending on um, what is coming up for you, there might be additional purposes. So later we're going to talk about purposes of taking notes when you're um, writing an essay as well. Um, but just in general, note taking, it will help you focus. Like it's, you know, it's very easy to drift off in lectures um, or, you know, if using a computer to navigate to another site or, you know, something like that, um, feel sleepy. But if you're taking notes, then it's less likely that you're going to do those things. Um, recording your understanding. A lot of people said that. People said also making a record for later. Um, somebody said summarizing, so that's like the same as condensing information um, and making study easier. That definitely was mentioned. Identifying what's important. Now that one is, um, I think Nicholas said that before the workshop started, you know, is like, how do you identify what's important? And I'm glad you're thinking that way, because, you know, if you're thinking about, I want to write down what's important, then you're less likely to fall into the pitfall of trying to get everything down and being completely overwhelmed when preparing for exams. Um, and then the final purpose is, you know, I mean, it, to me, it's kind of obvious, but it's not necessarily obvious um, about increasing your note taking skills so that you'll get better and better at it throughout university and um, have skills that you can just sort of continue to, to use when you're in the workforce and everything. Um, so I, I definitely have met a lot of students that say, you know, I don't take notes in lecture, I'm not good at taking notes, you know, that kind of thing, or, or if the professor provides notes, that's great, I can, you know, follow those notes, but I don't take my own, um, you know, and, and it's kind of like, they're looking at their note taking skills as something that's fixed, something that can't be developed. Um, and there, you know, there's uh, a body of, of work about fixed versus growth mindsets and its effect on learning in university. Um, you might be aware of, um, and like it's it's just very important not to see the skills you have at any given moment or like how you've performed in school at one time as being like carved in stone or stamped on your forehead. You know, all of these things can be developed, including your note-taking skills. So uh, practice and learning strategies like you are here is a great way to develop a skill. Like if you feel like your note-taking is not your best skill, it's almost like all the more reason to take notes as opposed to just giving up on it. <clears throat> so part of condensing information is summarization. Um, but another part of it is like the different sources of where information is coming at you. So sometimes people have three sets of notes on a given topic, you know, so, um, you know, maybe they have the professor's slides if the professor is kind enough to provide some slides, um, the notes that they've taken in lecture separately, and notes that they took when they did the reading. You know, so a given concept in the course, you know, it, it, it might be discussed like three times in your own writing and it might be kind of all identical, you know, or maybe one of the places has additional details and the other places do not. And, you know, to me, that's like a waste of time and it kind of like leads to disorganization. 
Um, so I would really recommend like condensing it all into a single set of notes. You know, and, and I don't mean having three sets of notes and then putting it together. I mean, you know, having like one set of notes to begin with from all the sources. So how do you do that? Um, you know, basically, you might read first, which I think in most cases is recommended. Um, and you take a set of notes when you're doing the reading. You leave a lot of space. And then you go to the lecture and um, you follow along your reading notes, you know, so you don't have to write everything down. A lot of students will complain that the like the information just kind of flies past them and um, and they don't grasp things and they can't keep up like, you know, like they're writing one thing down and that means they're not listening to the next thing the professor is saying. Um, doing your reading first and having a good set of notes that you're just simply adding to is a really great way to avoid that problem. Um, so it's almost kind of trite that reading before a lecture is recommended. Um, and, you know, the reason is that you can kind of control your own pace when you're reading. Um, I think a lot of people want to cut corners and find shortcuts when they're reading. There really isn't a shortcut. Um, speed reading, you know, will interfere with retention of information and comprehension. So we just recommend that in the first few weeks of school, you keep a record of how long your readings take for each course so that you become better and better at estimating how long it's going to take and just setting aside that amount of time in your schedule so that you're able to do it. Um, you know, and I think particularly if English is not your first language, um, it's really important to start the process of learning and understanding information um, over a medium where you can, can control the pace of learning. Because if it's a live lecture, you can't control the pace. And sometimes professors go more quickly than you would like. You know, and, and, and a lot of the time that's because they're assuming that students have done the reading. Um, so, you know, if you haven't, the concepts can really fly past you quickly before you get a chance. Um, during the pandemic, it wasn't as big an issue. I mean, well, I mean, we are still in the pandemic, but if you have courses that are remote, especially if the lectures are recorded, um, or if it's just, you know, you're accessing recorded material in the first place, it's not such a big deal um, with the pace of the lecture. Because in that case, like you can just watch the recording at your own pace. And if there's something you miss, you can rewind it and watch that part again. Uh, you can pause it if you're losing focus. You know, so if you have lecture recordings, then, you know, that's, that's really great. Um, but, you know, now the things are much more alive and in person. Um, that's something you have to pay attention to is like, how am I going to deal with the pace of the lectures? Um, if the notes are, you know, provided by the professor and you can access them in advance, like sometimes the professor will provide it after, not before. Um, quite often it's just an outline and it doesn't have a lot of details in it. You know, and they might do that on purpose because they don't want students cutting corners and just relying on their notes without like doing the readings and taking their own notes. Um, so if you have it in advance, you know, then I would bring that set of notes to lecture like I would, um, you know, read it in advance like that would be a good way to prepare for the lecture by knowing, you know, what in general is coming up. Um, and personally, I would print it out. Uh, I would print it out, you know, with a lot of gaps in between points, extra gaps, so that I could fill in details um, from my lecture. And if the professor provides it um, early enough, then you have a chance to print it out with a bunch of gaps, do your readings, take notes from your readings into the printed lecture notes, and also then bring that to the lecture. You know, and if you have a good set of notes, 
prior to the lecture, then you can really focus on what the professor is saying and, you know, not worry about writing down everything. You can kind of follow it along and you're like, okay, I have all of this. Um, I, you know, here there's an additional detail I'm going to jot down in the right space. You know, and you can also do it by like downloading the set of notes and making spaces or, you know, like various ways you can do it if you're not taking notes by hand. Um, so yeah, I mean, like, I think, I think the, the closer you can get to just having like one set of notes from the outset that can kind of combines everything, the better. Um, so I think for the most part, reading before your lecture and having a good set of notes is a good idea. Um, there are some exceptions to this, you know, because I didn't always do that when I was a university student. Um, and sometimes it tripped me up if the professor was kind of hard to follow or, you know, there's a lot of information. But a lot of the time I got away with it and I would get away with it um, because, you know, maybe the lecture was really straightforward, you know, maybe like a really excellent lecturer, really logical, um, easy to understand, you know, and then in contrast, the textbook, or it might not even be a textbook, it might be a bunch of journal articles that were written for PhDs in the field, you know, that in some cases, the readings are much harder to understand. You know, and if that's the case, um, I would recommend reversing the process and, you know, going to lecture, um, getting a good set of notes, whether that involves the professor's notes or not, uh, and then leaving some space to fill it in um, from reading later. You know, I still wouldn't recommend skipping the reading entirely, but just bringing the knowledge you have from the lecture to the reading would be a good idea. Okay, so um, I'm kind of interested in what sorts of lectures people here have um, this term. So can you put in the chat box, like is it in-person? Um, you know, I would just say in-person, remote, um, or recorded, you know, or a combination. Um, yeah, because then, you know, I can tailor some of my comments uh, in this next part to what people are going to be seeing. Um, so combination, remote and recorded, someone has all in person, remote, synchronous, asynchronous. Yeah, so I guess I should really touch upon all of them and I'm glad that that's what I plan to do anyhow. Um, okay, so preparation. So, um, I mean, I just, you know, went on and on about how reading the material is really great preparation for lectures, but, you know, also like reviewing any notes that are posted, reviewing notes that you took in the previous lecture, you know, so because a lot of the time the information builds. So like being really familiar with the foundation you're going in with is good. Um, you know, at least looking at the syllabus and knowing basically what the topic is. Um, and I would say if you don't get a chance to do the reading in full beforehand, uh, even just skimming through the material. Um, so say it's a textbook, you know, you could look at um, section headings, you can look at any words that are in bold, you can look at, you know, if there's any pictures or any graphs, um, you know, some people recommend like reading the introduction paragraph, the conclusion paragraph, um, the topic sentences for each paragraph, you know, that's, that's kind of a reasonable shortcut if you don't have a chance to do the full reading before the lecture. At least, you, you know, you're giving yourself some context um, so that the information that's coming at you quickly uh, will stick a little bit better. Um, and sleep is actually also a really good preparation for lecture. Um, because I think a lot of the time when people lose focus during their lectures, it, it has to do with being tired, you know, falling asleep. I mean, yes, some lectures, including sometimes myself, can be kind of monotonous. Um, but if you, you know, if you're really alert and you're trying to take good notes, then a lot of people can deal with that. But if you're really sleep deprived, it, it's much harder to stay focused. So it's not just about showing up to your lectures, but it's about being, you know, in good shape to learn. Um, so there's been a lot of research about student performance and sleep 
And it really has shown strongly that um, students who are typical university age, so say like 18 to 24, need about eight to nine hours of sleep on a consistent basis every night. So if you have an 8.30 lecture and you have like an hour and a half commute, you know, so say you're going to have to wake up two hours before the lecture, you know, that means you're waking up at 6.30, um, you know, that really means you need to go to bed by about like 10 or 10.30 to get a decent amount of sleep, which I know a lot of people, you know, don't like doing that uh, at your age. Um, but it's, it's something to pay attention to because, you know, like if, if you drag yourself to your 8.30 class really sleep deprived, I think it's still better than not going at all, but, you know, really you're making that sacrifice um, to come to class and you're, you're, you're just not going to get as much out of it as if you had been well rested. Okay, so, you know, whether it's an in-person class or online or you know, recorded, um, you want to keep your distractions away. And I think distractions were, you know, it was, it was almost worse when it was all remote learning, you know, like you could be in your room with your video off, you could be doing whatever, like you could be going into the kitchen for a part of it and making yourself something to eat, missing 15 minutes entirely, and nobody would be the wiser, you know, or playing on your phone or playing a video game while you attend. Um, you know, or chatting with a friend or, you know, whatever, right? So um, that was kind of a huge problem for people. And in in-person lectures, it can be um, also, you know, not, I don't think quite as bad, but, you know, people who are on their phones or who are, you know, kind of going between their notes on their laptop and, you know, um, some other website like Facebook or Instagram or something like that. Yeah, like, you know, multitasking with your brain doesn't really work. It makes it a lot less efficient. So just do everything possible to reduce distractions. I guess the other thing is if you're at home, um, one problem that a lot of students were talking about were other people being noisy at home um, or people trying to stream at the same time as their lecture. So their Zoom would be kind of iffy uh, or, you know, interruptions like you know your parents asking you to do something or whatever um so i think it's really important to talk to the other people in your household to share your class schedule with them you know so that they know when you have a class so they won't interrupt you um so that they you know will try to avoid streaming to the extent that they can at the same time so that they'll answer the door if the doorbell rings um, you know, those are good ideas if you're doing it from home. Um, so if you're on Zoom or um, if you're in person, it really helps to create some accountability around not having other distractions having, happening at the same time. Um, so can anyone, you know, does anyone have any ideas either by unmuting yourself or dropping in the chat? Um, how you can be creating accountability for yourself to pay attention uh, when you're in a lecture, whether it's um, from home or whether it's in a lecture theater or classroom. So Hannah says, turn on the camera or sit in front. Yes, that's exactly what I was going after. I mean, I'm sure there are um, other answers as well, but you know, uh, there has been research uh, on lecture theaters. I mean, not so much smaller classrooms, but lecture theaters that um, the students that are sitting closer to the front you know, tend to have a much higher proportion of A's. And as you kind of move back the lecture theater, uh, the grades tend to decline. There's like a lot more F's. It's a correlation. Like it doesn't mean that that's the cause, but um, it does seem to make sense that if you are in the front uh, and the professor can see you really easily, 
um, then you're less likely to be like looking at your phone or talking to the person next to you or doing something like that obviously shows that you're distracted. Um, and Anushka said, participate in discussions. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good way to be focused as well. You know, if you kind of have the intention, you know, to maybe raise your hand and ask a question or something like that, then you're going to be on the ball for sure. Um, and yeah, and in a Zoom lecture, you know, turning on your video creates the same sort of accountability as uh, being in a lecture theater, you know, because you're probably not going to want to be doing a bunch of other things, obviously, if the professor can see you. Um, so recorded lectures, you know, so like asynchronous, some of you said that you have asynchronous lectures. Those can be really nice in some ways, you know, because you can take breaks whenever you need, like if you're, if you find you're losing focus or something. Um, or if you realize, like you've watched a bit and you realize, oh, geez, I really should have read this first. You know, you can take a break, do the reading, come back. Um, you can rewind it if there's some parts that you've missed. You know, so it, it's very nice. Sometimes, like actually, I've had students say to me that um, I really like recorded lectures because I can play them back at a faster speed uh, and it's more efficient. Um, and I would say that really isn't a very good idea. Um, because there has been research about that uh, at one and a half times that a lot of comprehension and retention is lost. Um, I mean, you know, if you play it at 1.1, I mean, maybe it's okay. I don't know. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, like you might think that you're getting it all, but not necessarily. Um, and, you know, I, I've had the experience, like, you know, I, I, I never intentionally played something fast, but I've had the experience where I'm listening just to a light podcast and, you know, I press the wrong thing on my phone and all of a sudden it's one and a half. And I notice that I'm like, oh my God, what's going on? <laughs> you know, like I'm not really following it as well. So I, I can like completely understand why that would be the case. Um, but the challenge of recorded lectures is keeping up, you know, so, so sometimes students um, will not feel an urgency to watch the recording because it's like, okay, well, you know, I've got to pay attention to these classes that are happening right now. And this other one I can just watch whenever. Um, and, you know, before you know it, you haven't watched three weeks of material and, you know, and then, oh, the midterm's coming up and it's this huge scramble. Um, so what I recommend if you have a recorded lecture is to um, actually schedule it in to your schedule um, the same way that you would a regular class. You know, you can just arbitrarily decide that, okay, I've got two hours of lecture to watch every week, and I'm going to pretend that it's a class happening live on Tuesdays between two and four, or maybe Tuesdays between two and five to give me some time to pause, rewind, and, you know, that kind of thing. And I'm going to write that in every week, you know, so Tuesdays between two and five every week, that's when I will watch this lecture, you know, and, and that really helps prevent getting completely behind. Um, so I was talking, you know, Nicholas was the first one to show up and uh, he was saying, you know, I'm, I'm here because I, I want to know what's important to write down. Um, so I'm going to be addressing that next. Um, anyone, you know, put in the chat what you think like would indicate that something is important enough to write down? If the prof writes it on the board, yeah, I mean, that's a good suggestion. Uh, something that wasn't part of the reading material. Well, I mean, if it, if it seems like really relevant and it wasn't part of the reading material, yes. You know, you still have to kind of use your judgment because like it could just be some digression that the professor is going on. 
but yeah, like, especially if it's like a main concept in the reading material and the professor is adding an additional detail or additional example um, or that kind of thing. Yeah, and with reading, yeah, if it's, I guess, emphasized in the textbook in some way, it's the same with lectures. Yeah, like, so professors emphasize by repeating or by writing it on the board or it's in their, you know, online notes. Um, things that can trigger your memory of the topic. So reading it back, you can remember what you learned. Yeah, that, that's good too. Um, and then speaking of triggers to your memory, if you're in a class and they're talking about um, a concept or a theory and, and it, it reminds you of something you previously learned in the course, you're like, oh, geez, this theory is kind of like that other theory, but there are some you know, big differences as well. Um, that's a good thing to take notes on, you know, not just what the professor is saying right at the moment, but like even noting down that it's, you know, it kind of strikes you as similar to something else. Because like that's really fodder for exam questions um, or like concepts that can be compared and contrast, for example, you know, or like where you're, you know, having to choose between concepts on a multiple choice test. So if something reminds you of something else and you know they seem like kind of major things that that's definitely something to note down um also you know sometimes when there's a class discussion it can be you know useful to take down points that your classmates have said you know particularly if you have papers to write you know and there's like some original ideas that came up in the discussion that got you thinking that can be like really useful as well. So, you know, definitely listening for key things, not just um, everything, you know, and then, and then also like if you brought in a set of notes from the reading, um, then, you know, you, like I said, you, you have to write down less, um, but, you know, you're just writing down additional details, but, uh, you know, if, if there's like some sort of small point and it doesn't seem to be connected to anything that was in the professor's like outline notes or anything that was in the readings, then, you know, probably you don't have to write it down. Um, so that brings up, you know, if you're, if it's better to take notes um, on your laptop or by paper and pen. And when I say paper and pen, I, you know, I would also extend that to a tablet with a pen where you're, you know, kind of handwriting on a tablet. Um, that would, I think that's more similar to the paper or pen method. So what, what do people think? What are people planning to do? Paper and pen. Paper and pen. Typing is less tiring and more efficient. Paper and pen. Paper, because I'm not a fast typer. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, I'm seeing, I don't know, like some, I don't know, misconceptions maybe about typing that are um, being perpetuated. Although, you know, I'm happy to see a lot of people said paper and pen. Um, Cause I, I, I kind of gave you a hint, you know, when I said I'd print out the professor's notes with, with some spaces in between and fill them in. Um, so there has been actually a lot of research about the value of taking notes longhand, whether that's paper and pen or like on a tablet. I don't know if a tablet has been specifically researched. Um, and part of it is the distraction factor, you know, so if you don't open up your laptop in class, then you have no way of navigating to other screens, you know, so that's one thing. But this particular study that is listed here, um, the way they did it was that you could only take notes if you were taking notes on a laptop. Um, and, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, it's like Nicholas said, it's more efficient, um, you know, and, and I could be misinterpreting it. So apologies if I am, but, you know, that might mean, okay, you can type more, you know, and, and if you keep the purpose in mind to kind of, you know, narrow down to the main points, and if you've already have a set of notes you're bringing in, then typing more is not so much the issue. 
Um, and then somebody also said that, you know, I take notes by hand because I'm not a fast typist, which kind of would imply that maybe if they were a fast typist, they'd take notes on a laptop, and, you know, and, and a lot of people who take notes on the laptop say, you know, I can type faster than I write. And that's, that's why. But if you keep the purpose of note taking in mind, you know, being to like select main ideas, so that, you know, you focus on the right ideas in your um, paper, your exam preparation. Um, you know, it's not about being fast. It's about being selective. And if you're handwriting, like because handwriting is slow, it forces you to be selective. Um, you know, you can't write it all down. So it forces you into this mindset where you're thinking, is this a main point? Is this something I need to write down? And then if you decide you have to write it down, you're automatically thinking, can I write it down in fewer words? So you're processing the information and trying to understand it and trying to rephrase it. So it's going to become more memorable for you than if you're just kind of touch typing and, you know, if, if you are a really fast typist and you can write it down in the same words as the professor, then you don't really even have to think about, which is not a good thing. Um, some people are really worried about missing things if they're taking notes by hand, you know, so um, quite apart from what we talked about before, it's always good to like review right after class or within 24 hours. Um, that puts it in your long-term memory anyhow. But one advantage also is that you can fill in gaps. So if you have 10 minutes between classes and you use it to review your notes, um, you know, probably you'll remember, like if you have an incomplete sentence and then you had to move on to writing something else down, you know, probably right away you'll remember, okay, these are the words that I'm missing here and be able to fill it in. And especially if you do it with a buddy, you know, and it's a lot easier to do it with a buddy in an in-person class and just make a practice of, okay, after class, we're going to go over our notes together and make sure that we, you know, both had the same understanding of things and captured everything we wanted to capture. Um, and, you know, if you and a buddy both don't understand something, then, you know, that tells you, okay, this is something we could go together to ask the professor about. And, uh, you know, and definitely going to professors or TAs office hours is an excellent idea. Um, but I know a lot of first year students are intimidated. And if you have a partner to go with, it can be a lot easier to do that. Um, okay. Okay, so readings. So we have, I think, about 15 minutes left in the official timing. I might go over, um, and if you, if you can stay, then great. If you have to leave, like, feel free to leave whenever, whenever you have to. And the recording will be up on our website within a week. So you can just catch up by watching the rest of the recording. Um, yeah, so University of North Carolina um, has really great materials on taking notes from reading. I'm gonna be referencing it like over and over again. Um, and at the moment, I just wanna give you the basics from a video that they made. So I'm gonna stop sharing this and I'm going to start um, sharing the video for you to watch. It's very short. It's like less than four minutes. And I just have to navigate to the correct tab. And while I do that, I'm going to drop this link. This is our link about listening and note taking in lectures. And I think I can drop it in the chat. Oh, nope, that's not the one I wanted to do. I think it's not letting me copy the links, actually. Yeah, it's not letting me copy the links. I'm, I apologize for that. 
Um, okay, so no taking from lectures and readings, University of North Carolina. Do you all there are see three this? major steps in from readings. Number one, preview. Number two, encode, that is digest while reading. Number three, elaborate, that is deepen the encoding after reading. Previewing what you'll read is important because information sticks in your brain better if your brain has been prepared to receive the information. Doing so allows your brain to more easily organize the information coming in, and this in turn will help your brain to better remember the information. Here are some examples of how you can preview what you will read. Read through chapter headings and subheadings. Read through summaries. Consider questions listed in the chapter. Read through tables and figures. And most especially, as you look through the reading, ask yourself what questions you think the chapter will answer. The second step is to encode, in other words, digest the information you are reading. What you may not know is that the most common methods of taking notes from readings, highlighting and or underlining, are not usually helpful for deeply processing the information. Most students highlight or underline too frequently and don't pause enough to actively think about what they're highlighting and why they're doing so. Research suggests that taking notes after you read short intervals of a text will help you more actively engage and therefore better remember the material. After reading through a paragraph or a section, stop. Then ask yourself, what are the main and supporting points? Write these down using the least number of words possible. If you have to write another paragraph to describe the paragraph you just read, you're not digesting enough. List these points, preferably in outline format, either in your textbook or, and this is my personal favorite, in a digital platform like Evernote. I prefer writing notes in Evernote, not only so that all my notes are within a few pages instead of dispersed throughout a textbook, but also so that I can review my notes whenever I want, since I can access Evernote from my laptop as well as from my smartphone. If you're still convinced that you should use highlighting, then highlight the least number of keywords to identify the main and supporting points. If you highlight a lot of text, it's a sign that you are not digesting enough. Using the method just described will decrease the need to reread in the future, making your reading time efficient as well as more effective in the long run. The final step is to elaborate on what you know in order to deepen the initial encoding. The key to doing this is to ask yourself a lot of questions. For example, is there another way of organizing the information which would make better sense? Would the information be better represented as a picture or a diagram, or perhaps as a table which shows similarities and differences between concepts? Would the information be better represented as a sequence, in other words, a series of steps? Does this new information relate in some way to things you already know? How so? What questions does the reading answer for you? What questions are still left unanswered? The more you think about concepts, the more likely it is that you will deeply encode the information. And the more deeply you encode, the better you understand and remember the information. Okay, I'll stop sharing that and go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so um, definitely like I've had this problem in the past and I think other people have, you know, I'm, I'm always hearing about it where, you know, somebody is just reads for several pages and, you know, 15 minutes later they put their head up and are like, I can't even remember what I read. So I really recommend short intervals. Um, so, you know, reading like a paragraph at a time or reading two paragraphs at a time, and then turning away and trying to remember what the main points are. Um, and even saying the main points aloud 
if you are reading someplace where you can do that, like not in a silent study area or something. Um, and that, that like serves a couple of functions. One is to check your understanding. And, you know, if it turns out that you blanked while you were reading that, you know, all you need to do is go back and reread a paragraph rather than rereading several pages. Um, and also like it, it right away, it gets you to try to select the main ideas and process the information, you know, and then afterwards you would write it down in your notes. Like once you were able to say it out loud um, or at least think about it out loud. Um, and that's, that's known as the three R method, like reading in short spurts, reciting out loud, and then recording what you recited. Um, and it's part of this like full methodology called SQ4R, which is, you know, a very famous concept in my field. Um, it stands for survey, which is like skimming through the pages like they're talking about in the video. Question, um, so, you know, say you've read some headings, uh, you might say, okay, how can I turn this heading into a question? You know, so like say it says the hypothalamus, you know, it's like what, what brain function does the hypothalamus do? Might be a question you prepare in advance of the main reading. Um, and then you're reading to try to answer those questions, you know, in short intervals. Um, you recite out loud, you record it. Um, and then you do a review afterwards. And, you know, definitely it's just like lectures that if you review within 24 hours from memory, it's going to move it into your long-term memory better. You know, I mean, from memory as much as you can, but then of course, going back and rereading what, whatever it is that you can't remember. Um, yeah. So you don't, I mean, you don't have to do that full method, um, but elements of it that you find useful, like will definitely help you take better notes. And I really recommend this 3R method. Um, yeah, and sometimes people's notes are as long as, you know, what's in the book. So what is the point of that, right? You're really just trying to narrow it down and be selective. And if you, you know, if you do do a bit of highlighting, um, then maybe like the word that you've highlighted can be a quiz word later, you know, where you like look at that word when you're preparing for exams and try to think of, you know, not just the definition, but, you know, what concepts is it related to? What are some examples of it? That kind of thing. Um, and, you know, and when, when you're doing research, you're reading to research for a paper or a presentation or something like that, like all the advice that you've had about note taking to date still holds, um, but there are some additional purposes that you need to think about, you know, so if you're preparing for like a multiple choice test or something, you, you know, it's fine just to write down the facts that you're reading in, um, in the book and maybe any relationships you notice with previous material, because those are really fodder for multiple choice tests. But when it's a paper, especially if it's an argumentative paper or a critical summary or something, then you should also be putting your own thoughts on the material in your notes. You know, so it's a good way of like organizing your ideas. Um, but, you know, also like, be engaging critically with your reading. And, and there is a critical reading resource, which I think is the last one that I copied before um, sharing my screen. So I think it actually did let me copy it and it keeps wanting to paste it in the chat box. So I will, I will paste that a bit later. Um, avoiding plagiarism is a really good function of taking notes when you're uh, reading for research, because you know if you just read stuff, um, and then you want to put something in your paper, you might not really remember where you found it, you know, and then it, and then it's like either you don't end up citing it, which could be plagiarism, or, you know, it takes you like an hour to find it again so that you can cite it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really important to take notes when you're doing research. Um, and this is something from University of New South Wales. Um, 
which like, you know, since I'm having <laughs> issues with dropping links, I guess you could take a picture of this link or something, or just Google um, New South Wales note taking from reading and you'll find it. Um, but this is like a template that they recommend um, for taking notes when you're reading. So you would put like all the bibliographic details of what you're reading from on the top. And then you make two columns and in the left hand column, you make your notes, you know, like what the book says, you're sort of sticking to what the book says. But in the right hand column is where you jot down your thoughts like, you know, is this supported by evidence, how consistent is it with other things I've read, you know, what questions do I have about this piece, that kind of thing. Um, and if I stop sharing this, I can show you a more detailed template that you can find on the University of New South Wales website. Um, as I got, I um, went to that link as well. Yeah. Um, so this is what the template looks like. I'm just going to have to move my, yeah. So it's, it's like the slide, like you have your notes in one column, you have your comments on the information and the other, the bibliographic details on the top. But if you actually go to where the template is, um, it gives you some pointers, you know, and, and actually in this column, it has like all the different types of questions. You know, what are some good questions to ask when you're doing the reading? You know, how is this relevant to my purpose? How does it relate to my assignment? How and where might I use it in my assignment? How does it relate to other information on the topic? So it's a lot of critical thinking questions are um, summarized there. And then there's just some pointers about what to put in each section. So I think, you know, this is like a really useful page to look at. And if you, uh, if you just Google University of New South Wales reading, note taking, you'll find it. Now I've got to move my little zoom bar again. So I can advance the slide. Yeah, so if you wanted to take a picture of this URL, um, that is, that will take you right to the template. Picture, screenshot or something. Uh, and then there's another one. Um, this is another template that's available from the Open University in England. Um, or you write down the source, you know, a general description of what you've gotten from that source, um, what the claims are, what evidence they present, and then you're evaluating, like, the, what you see is the strengths and weakness. What questions do you have? How does it connect to other topics? So it's kind of a simpler template, but, you know, like a lot of these things, the strengths and the weaknesses, the links to other topics, you know, those are things you really want to think about if you're going to be writing a good paper. And that link is right there, but this is the one that I think is saved when I try to copy other things. So I can put this one in the chat anyhow. Um, and the great thing about this link is that it's actually a fairly long handbook. Um, I don't know, like 20 page, 30 page, you know, handbook about um, critical thinking and critical reading. And this is just one of the pages of the hand, handbook. And I think, you know, getting the hang of critical thinking and critical reading um, is a crucial skill for success in university, particularly if you're taking a lot of arts, social science types classes or communication. Um, and, you know, a lot of people don't really develop it all that well in first year. So, you know, if you take a look at this in first year and follow some of the advice, it'll, it'll really give you a leg up. Um, so format of notes. So this is, you know, probably a good thing to do if you have PowerPoint notes that the professor provides in advance. 
um, printing it out this way uh, will give you like a lot of um, space to take your own notes right beside it, you know, and that could be reading notes that you're taking right into that document or further notes from the lecture. Uh, flashcards, that could be, you know, a format. I think a lot of people will use flashcards to study afterwards, but maybe they'll initially take their notes in another format. Um, I have heard from students who, you know, just take their initial notes on flashcards and kind of cut out the middleman. <laughs> um, but flashcards, I don't know. Like, I, it, they're not really my favorite um, because they almost lead students to just sort of write a word on the front and a definition on the back, you know, which would be like preparing for a straight memorization test. Um, and in university, there's like not a lot of straight memorization tests, like they're more focused on comparing and contrasting and, you know, maybe applying what you've learned to new examples. So, um, I, you know, and I think a con like in this context, flashcards may not be quite as useful. Um, I definitely have talked to science students who will, you know, like where they have to learn information that's kind of in a diagram um, and they might, you know, put the word on the front and the diagram on the back and, you know, and try to remember the different elements of the diagram. So that, you know, I'm not saying it's completely useless or anything. Mm. Annotation. Um, a lot of sources are recommending this. You know, this is definitely a way, um, especially if professors are not providing notes in advance and you're just trying to consolidate your reading notes and your lecture notes. It's like it's a way of doing it. It's taking your reading notes and maybe even your lecture notes like right um, in the book, you know, if you're not planning to resell the book. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that, that could be a good way of condensing it and being able to refer back to the original if there's not enough detail. So there's more information about this format and some of the other formats if you go to the University of North Carolina reading and note-taking information. Um, Cornell Notes, that is a personal favorite of mine and of a lot of learning specialists. So um, this example is if you're using Cornell Notes for a lecture, but you can also use it, you know, for readings or for review notes as well, um, where you write your notes, like you, you know, say, it, say it's on paper, I think there are ways of doing it electronically as well, but you would split your paper up like this. Um, and you know, during the class, you would take the notes in the right hand margin, which is the biggest section. And then afterwards, you know, you would try to um, come up with a quick summary or like select the main ideas to put at the bottom, you know, and right away you're thinking about what are the main ideas. Um, and then you can use the left hand column after class to fill in some questions or keywords that relate to the notes. And that really helps when you're reviewing the next time, because you can just like cover up your notes and try to remember the information based on the questions and the keywords. Um, you know, so like I say, memory isn't like all the tests are about at university by any means, but in order to go to higher levels of analysis, you pretty much have to remember the information. And I'd say even for open book tests, you don't have enough time to look up everything. So memory is kind of the first step. Um, and, you know, it's not enough to prepare for tests just by rereading things because it'll look familiar, but on the test, you have to reconstruct things from memory. So that would be a strength of, you know, this method or even of flashcards, um, you know, that if you're reviewing throughout the term using them, then you're practicing reconstructing your memory and it won't be such a new skill that you have to do on a test. Um, tables, I really like tables, um, especially for theory classes. Theory classes, you get a lot of compare contrast questions. So putting the theorists down one column and you know areas where their theories might overlap or differ along you know, the other dimension. Um, you can pretty much summarize a whole theory course in one spreadsheet <laughs> if, if you need to.
um, literature courses, like a lot of the time, if you're taking an English course, um, they will ask a lot of compare and contrast questions about, you know, how these different novels um, portray different themes or, you know, how, like how imagery is used in the different novels. So tables are really good for that as well. Um, concept maps are fantastic also for showing relationships. Um, you know, and showing like what are the primary concepts and the details under each concept. If somebody is, you know, a very visual person, um, you know, then then drawing things out and adding colors is going to make the information more memorable and it'll make it easier to understand relationships between different parts of the course. And this one also you can look at um, additional details on University of North Carolina. Um, this one is interesting. This is like one of um, the graduate students that used to work with us uh, sent this to me, you know, from, um, I think it was from her Facebook or something. Um, and it was like, well, what do you think of students, you know, a bunch of students in a class collaborating, taking notes into one Google Doc? Um, and, you know, I personally think there are strengths and weaknesses of that. Um, I, you know, the weakness is that you might end up with like this really super long document, <laughs> um, you know, that that isn't very useful. That's just going to kind of waste your time, right? Because like if you're taking notes partly to narrow down the main points, then why would you want to have like notes from all sorts of people that could be pouring the kitchen sink into it or saying the main points, um, you know, many, many times, like this big, long thing to read when you, you know, you want to be efficient. So I, I would say like, you know, that aspect, I don't think it's the greatest idea, but um, one way to use that is if everybody's in the same Google Doc is, you know, you can ask each other questions, you know, and provide each other answers. Like, you know, if there's something you don't understand, you can ask a question in it and maybe somebody else could answer it quickly. Um, you don't want to really be missing a bunch of stuff in the lecture while you're doing that though. But, um, you know, like if somebody asks a question and then you read it and you realize, wait a minute, I have the same question, you know, that might sort of tip you off that maybe put up your hand and ask that in class or something. Okay, so to get the most from your notes, um, I used to really fall short on this. Like I used to take very good notes in university for some reason. It was something I was just naturally able to do. I think I was just very good at honing in on the main points and I wrote really quickly and whatever. But um, I wouldn't have them well organized. You know, sometimes I would have my binder for the course with me, sometimes I wouldn't, you know, and sometimes I would forget to put the notes in my binder and um, I would end up with notes all over the place that I couldn't even necessarily locate when I went to do exam preparation. So after a couple of years of that, I usually took notes in um, a notebook, like a bound notebook. <laughs> um, but that also created like if you know professor handed out handouts it created an issue i think these days professors are not nearly as likely to hand out handouts um and then the electronic equivalent is you know having a folder on your computer for each class and you know maybe a subfolder for lecture notes and just you know regularly making a point of filing your notes in that folder Um, and I, I have talked periodically about reviewing the notes regularly, especially from memory. And this is the reason, this is a really important concept in my field. Um, and it's kind of about how memory works. So at the top uh, of the black line, like you've just been to your lecture, you've just done a piece of reading. You don't necessarily know 100% of it, but you know 100% of what you know. Um, and say you didn't do any review until the midterm, like in the first day, your memory of it is going to drop by about half, you know, and that, and that really reflects that you need to review it to move it into your long term memory to tell your brain, hey, this is important, you've got to keep this. Um, and then if you wait until like a month later when you have a midterm, 
like, look how low this, this line is. Like, it means that you're retaining maybe 5% of the information. Like, very little of the information is even in your memory. And remember, I said to succeed on tests, you have to do more than remember. So that's why, you know, like a lot of people will think that they're leaving themselves a decent amount of time to study before the exam, you know, like even I've, I've left myself four days, this is really good. Um, and then they end up running out of time, because they think they're studying, but really they're relearning practically everything because they never reviewed. Um, so the solution is to review within 24 hours. But, you know, keep trying to remember the information and re refer to your notes if you can't, like on a periodic basis, like, you know, flip through all your notes for the course once a week, once every 10 days, you know, something like that, all throughout the term, trying to reconstruct the information and rereading it if you can't. Um, and, you know, then you will get to the period before the test, you'll be at about like at least 80 percent ish memory, if not 100%. Um, and then you can just practice, you know, trying to find relationships between concepts, trying to answer, you know, practice questions, uh, trying to apply the information to new material. Um, you'll have time for that because you'll, you'll kind of know everything. Um, and a lot of people will say that they don't have enough time to do frequent review. That's what these um, time signatures are about that, you know, they're basically showing that the time declines the more you review. Because like maybe the first time you review your notes, it takes you 10 minutes like per lecture to read over the notes. Uh, I mean, that would be a lot of time if you have a lot of lectures um, to review. But as you get more and more familiar with the material, you know, you might just have to read a word and a bunch of stuff is going to come back to you. You know, so it really might decline to just take a couple of minutes to flip through your pages of a lecture and refresh your memory of it. Okay, so this this is, you know, like pretty much the end. Um, and I should actually change this slide because our website looks somewhat different now. Uh, but I just wanted to point you to some resources on the Student Learning Commons website. Um, so this learning and studying in orange, it has a ton of information on a bunch of different study strategies and even things that are, you know, you might not think we have because they're kind of marginally related things, things like sleep, things like, you know, the, the bad effects of perfectionism and how to counteract them. Um, and I kept, you know, I was talking about recordings. Um, if you want to watch a recording of a webinar we've done in the past, you just go to this attend a workshop page, which is also where you can get the information on co curricular record. Um, and you, you scroll all the way down, and it'll take you to a page where we have our webinar recordings. Um, so I would like you if you can to put in the chat box, you know, maybe like one thing that you learned that you're, you know, really looking forward to implementing, you know, something that you think was your key takeaway that you're going to use. Um, because this is again where I fell down as a student in university, I sometimes would go to workshops and get all these great ideas and, but I would never form like a full intention of actually implementing them and I tended not to implement them. So um, I want to do something to, you know, try to ensure that you'll implement at least, you know, one of the ideas. So um, yeah, go ahead and put something in the chat. The other thing is when you do fill out that reflection form um, to get a co-curricular record credit, it's going to ask you also what you're going to implement. Mm, okay, Brianne wants to try Cornell notes and review after class. Um, Nicholas is going to experiment with things like mind maps and, and graphs. Yeah, you know, and I and I think experimenting with different forms of note taking is really good. Like the the type that you first try might not be the most useful for you. Um, yep. Yeah, so Anushka also uh, Cornell notes and questioning, um, and yeah, and Hannah wants to record how long readings will take. Take yeah, I I honestly think this is this is applicable to really anything that you have to do on a repeated 
basis in university, like if you have um, several assignments in a course that are going to be similar in the term, um, record how long it took you to do the first assignment, the second assignment, you know, and by the time you get to the third assignment, you probably will have like a much better idea of how long it's going to take. Um, Nicholas wants to print out the lecture slides yeah, and then maybe take notes into them, which is a good idea. Yeah, I'm glad that, you know, a lot of you have some ideas of what you want to implement. Um, and if you want to take a picture or something of the link, for, the direct link for the co-curricular record credits, you can do that, even though, like I told you how to find it. Um, so, yeah, we're done. I'm sorry I've gone for like 20 minutes longer than I was supposed to. Um, thank you for bearing with me and uh, apologies to anyone who's watching the rest of it by recording. Um, it's, it's also a good time if anyone wants to ask questions, you can put your questions in the chat or unmute yourself. Uh, or if somebody wanted to ask me a question privately, you know, you're, I will stay for a bit and you're welcome to also stay to ask your question. <laughs>